Okay, uh, welcome to another episode of Crime Pays But Botany Does It. Now today, I is coming to you from one of the many prairies in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. I'm at an elevation of about 600 feet here, uh, and it's uh, out of the second week of October and roughly 92 degrees outside. I'm fucking baking. As you can see, we got some uh, wonderful patches of uh, prairie sage salvia azurea in front of us. Got some solid dago. Also got uh, some restoration going on. Those are... Uh, little uh, branches of uh, ligustrum, the invasive ligustrum, olive family oleaceae, and you can see they've been removing it and then a spot applying herbicide because it uh, apparently has escaped cultivation from the uh, tacky tract houses in which it was planted and that uh, has now, you know, kind of taken over the area. You'll see some areas later where it's just, I mean, it's it's everywhere, you know, kind of forms like a wall in the understory at, at the cedar and ash forest over there. Now you can see over here we got some uh, Symphiotrichum ericoides that uh, kind of <clears throat> this little tiny white flower right there. You can see why it's called ericoides. It's got the uh, heath like, that is the genus Erica like uh, leaves. Also got some liatris, some ambrosia trifida, and then the grasses here are mostly little blue stem grass. Okay, Schizacrium scoparium. Let's see what else we got going on. Okay, you can see this plant forming this kind of low patchy ground cover right here with uh, a couple of orange leaves. Let's see if we can get up close show you. Oh yeah, see see the little uh, the little dangling ovary right there. Tiny. And then this plant right here, this is a Scutellaria dromondii. Remember the mint family Lamiaceae. Note the opposite leaves. Covered the leaves are covered in tiny hairs. Got a zygomorphic bilaterally symmetrical corolla with that, that nice speckling on a perianth there. And then, of course, the top, the little hood is covered in hairs, too. There's the calyx down there. And over here, we got one of uh, a few species of yucca in the region. This is yucca arkansana. All right, and you can distinguish it from the other species in the region because it's got, well, one of the other more prominent species in the region, in the region yucca palata, because it's got the... the uh, hairs on it which yucca palata does not have and when you look at the margin it's uh, got that uh, that white margin to it okay whereas yucca palata has a red margin oh nice now uh, speaking of mints here's another one this is a hedioma revertonii okay and it's you it's quite obviously a mint you got the opposite leaves you got the uh, bilaterally symmetrical flowers Okay, and of course you got a nice fragrance to it too. Look at the calyx as well. A green calyx looks like a salvia calyx. And of course it wouldn't be the prairie without some uh, sorgastrum natans. You can see those uh, prominent uh, drooping stamens just hanging out of the uh, individual florets. And that nice blue color as well. Coming up uh, right next to some yuck arkansana. And then, of course, here's one of my favorite plants. This is a, a Texas endemic. This is Silphium albiflorum. And it's not flowering right now. They flower in May, which is pretty notable because the rest of the genus flowers, I don't know, usually in July, August, September. But uh, it's, this is a plant that's, like I said, endemic to Texas. And you, oh, you normally when you see it, uh, I'll see it growing in places with the really thin topsoil and, uh, you know, the limestone beneath. So it's a limestone endemic. It's got a white flower, which is also weird because the rest of the genus has all yellow flowers, yellow flower heads. And, uh, but like most silphiums, the, uh, you could see right here, the inner florets are sterile. They're just functionally staminate. And the, the actual achenes, the fertile seeds occur on a margin, on the margin, the outer margin of the, uh, capitulum right there. Oh yeah. And of course, you know, it's the colloquial name for the genus is rosin weeds. And I just got a bunch of that sticky sap on my hand from touching it so this plant is a perennial it's dormant right now it's gone back into the ground okay that's probably why the phenology is different from the rest of the genus too it's you know it's adapted to generally hotter drier sites okay oftentimes like i said you'll see it growing on nearly bare limestone without without any topsoil at all all right but it can be grown in cultivation and it needs to be grown more a friend of mine grew these and said that as long as you get them in the ground the first year they do fine because they send down a deep tap root okay otherwise if you don't they'll just become pot bound they don't really they don't really thrive too much but there's the old phyleries you could see all spiky as hell and uh, quite painful to get stabbed with 
of course the uh, the base of the leaves right there kind of reminiscent of Silphium licinianum which is it's probably uh, you know allied to it's probably probably a species that it uh, that it uh, emerged from however many millions of years ago so there you go Silphium albiflorum of course there we go Ambrosia trifida probably one of the most uh, weedy natives around they can get upwards of 20 feet tall in a single season they are an annual and uh you know they're, they're the reason a lot of people uh suffer from hay fever uh right about now because all the all these all these staminate the strictly staminate the capitula up here each one of those all right whereas the you can see there's the female the female capitula at the bottom you can see the uh the akeens maturing but these entire you know each one of these uh spikes is just you know filled with a bunch of uh a staminate capitula that you know just basically male flowers that just dump out wind dispersed pollen okay one of the few wind dispersed uh genera in uh the sunflower family asteraceae you can see why it's called trifida it's got the it's got trifid leaves i love this plant all right you'll see it in vacant lots a lot and it, you know some people hate it but it's <laughs> fucking i mean to get you get upwards of 20 feet tall in a season. They're just very, very aggressive uh, native plants. And probably weedy uh, on other continents. Nice. And over here we got Brachelia eupatorioides. Okay. Because it looks like a eupatoria. But, uh, you know, at least when it's going off. Let's see one with the styles poking out. Got kind of eupatoriaish styles. Yeah, not really. There's the leaves on it. Glistening in the sun and probably laden with all kinds of... Uh, Nice uh, secondary metabolites and phytochemistry to make it uh, unappealing to things that would want to gnaw on it. Beautiful uh, discoid flowers, no ligules, no daisy rays. Look at the phyleries. Okay, the phyleries are almost uh, almost like little hairs. Okay, very, very thin. Very thin and filamentous phyleries on this bastard. Okay, tends to like it hot and dry. Uh, you get it in northern Illinois. Um, I believe it's the only species of Brachelia in the immediate region. All right, and again, it sticks out with those those yellow flower heads, just uh, filled with the uh, strictly disc florets. Some nice liatris punctata over there, and just a, a huge patch of uh, of prairie sage, of blue prairie sage, Salvia azurea. All right, never gets old. You can see this guy's thriving in the hot and dry, thriving in the 90 degree heat in mid mid October. Just massive. Uh, Massive uh, lower petals right there. Nice landing pad again. The leaves, of course, opposite mint family again. Got a square stem. Not all the mints have square stems. Not all the Lamiaceae have square stems, but a lot do. And of course, ah, the, the leaves smell kind of good. Because they're ridden with those volatiles that the... You know, hopefully make things not want to knot them. And there, of course, is that the Skyzacrium. The little blue stem. See those purple anthers? Nice blue uh, leaf blades down there at the base. Okay, and here's the other yucca you get in the region. This is yucca pallida. And it's growing right next to... Uh, a plant that is not blooming, but I'm going to take the seed of this. And a, a rather beautiful plant, too, when it is going off, okay, in April or May. This is Penstemon cobea right here. You can see the seed capsules. And there's all the seeds. So put them in your little uh, drug baggie that you keep around for the cops, you know, to get them all excited and aroused and whatnot. And uh, save some, try to grow them next spring, try to germinate them next spring. Anyway, moving on to that yucca palette, you can see it doesn't have, it lacks the hairs that yucca arkansana has, and it's got that uh, kind of a red margin on it if you can see right there on the edge it's kind of like it can be red it can be kind of orangish quite dentate look at the little teeth on the margin of that leaf right there all right and a much wider leaf as well okay easy to distinguish uh from yucca arkansana without even looking at the the margin of the leaves but just in case you want to be sure and of course when they're when they're blooming you got a flower spike with you know big ass white yucca flowers on it too looking like uh kind of like a lily like lily flowers which uh this yucca was actually this Whole genus was actually used to be placed in the uh, in the lily family before uh, you know it was realized it's obviously not it's not related to it but uh, 
Thank God for molecular phylogenetics, huh? Oh, here's a nice one. Ariagonum longifolium. Look at these tiny flowers. Not much is still blooming at this particular spot, but you, you can see these guys are. Tiny little star-shaped flowers. Okay, green petals with a white margin. And you can even see the, the nectary down there. Just glistening in the sun. In the hot 90-degree sun. Green, glabrous stem, and then, of course, uh, those leaves, if it's still got them. Well, it's got more basal leaves down there. But you could see you got some leaves along the stem. Narrow with the tips. Almost uh, lanceolate. But again, glabrous up top. And then, uh, the tomatose on the bottom. Okay, this is a small, this is small for the species. I've seen them get upwards of a tree four feet tall before. You can see more over there. There we go, another a wonderful bastard of the dry limestone prairies. This is a formerly Stenosiphon, but now uh, in the, uh, the Onothera genus, the Onothera genus, and the Onagracea, the evening primrose family. This is uh, Onothera glossifolia. You can see it's quite, uh, it's quite tall, just standing up like a beacon in the night amongst the, the background of the yellow composite, the Amphiacris, which uh, the Amphiacris, we'll get into that later, was voted most ubiquitous uh, composite, uh, North Texas composite of 1989. You know, and it uh, didn't win any subsequent years because the whole sex scandal it was involved in, but we won't talk about that right now. Anyway, uh, you can see this this bastard is just uh, quite magnificent, very tall, just a really uh, really wonderful fucker right here. I don't know how it's you know flowering in fucking 95 degree heat, but it's uh, it's doing pretty well for itself over there. It's nice. I always like the sound of sirens in the background. Okay, yeah, there you go. See those, what look like bracts, those are actually the uh, ovaries, those are the fruits. Okay, so the flower's already hissed off this one, and, uh, you know, each one of those ovaries has uh, God knows how many tiny little seeds inside. So the whole plant has probably upwards of, you know, three or four thousand seeds on it, okay? It's going to lead to a lot of uh, recruitment uh, once the weather cools off, though it's hard to believe that ever happened, because I'm fucking really dying out here. These, I'm not a hot weather person. You'd think I was, but at least just not at the moment. It's just, you know, it really gets tiring. But uh, anyway, there's the flower seeds. These are still gone. There you go, Onathra glossifolia. And there we go. Since we are on a hot, dry limestone prairie with very little topsoil, you're going to see our old friend, the Sylphium albiflorum again. See, there's the flower heads. Okay. It always amazes me. Not very tall for a Sylphium. Okay, but it's got those very scabbard leaves reminiscent of uh, Silphium laciniatum, the quote compass plant. But anywhere you're on, you know, the hot dry limestone in north central Texas with very little topsoil, you're going to see this guy. Right, let's look at this guy, a member of the Coreopsis tribe of the composite family, of course. Look at all those styles pushing that pollen out, doing that whole secondary pollen presentation thing that they're so well known for. Now, of course, you've got centripetal maturation with composites, and you can see it here. Okay, and notice how the outer, uh, the outer styles are already doing that Y-shaped thing, okay? Already bending back like little bug antennas, but the ones in the middle are still in the male phase, the staminate phase. They're still uh, presenting pollen, uh, but uh, they will mature, of course, and do the whole, uh, you know, the, the styles will recurve, the style branches will recurve, and they'll bend back. So, you know, that's the, that's the glory of composites. They're always flowering they're always uh presenting uh, pollen you know because the you got so many flowers so many florets clustered together in a composite head that there's always going to be food for pollinators for the bees and with the shit that the uh, come get them so it's you know they've got a much longer flowering time than they would if it was just one single flower like uh like many plants tend to be but uh, of course coreopsis tribe you could see that right there see those little uh you know spinose bracts those are the uh colliculi which is a dead giveaway for the Coreopsis tribe. Okay, and then Philofolium, I mean, it's easy. You can see it's got filamentous foliage. Okay, really common plant uh, out here in the uh, the dry prairies. But, uh, you know, it's still a banger. Look at, oh, look at that one. Oh. Here we go. Here's this nice species of prickly pear, nice species of Opuntia with the bright red fruits, which are, of course, edible if you can uh, shave all the uh, glockids and spines off now it looks like somebody uh threw their uh, shitty teepee on this uh individual but uh it's not actually toilet paper it's cochineal scale those are insects and it was a major source of uh of dye uh, for many uh, indigenous people uh in mexico you could see 
once you crush it, it turns red. Pretty remarkable. Let's go get some. Go go get yourself a, a Zapotec rug dyed with the damn uh, cochineal scale on it. But it's a sorry, kind of a sorry looking cactus, you know. It's fucking hot. The cactus thinks it's hot too. Okay, shit doesn't have to be flowering for you to be able to uh, enjoy it, identify it, study it, whatever the fuck. Case in point with this guy, Plectocephalus americanus, okay? Cardioidea subfamily, the thistle subfamily, the composite family, Asteraceae. Look at those, uh, you can still see the phyleries. They got those, uh, kind of, you know, laciniate the fringe on them, okay? See that? All fringy and spiky, you know, kind of got that, I guess you could call it a, maybe a ciliate margin, all right? But, you know, it's deader in hell. I guess there's seeds in there, supposedly. You can see the pappus right there. Let me see if I can get any out. Maybe not. It's a real banger when it's going off, you know, but of course we're about five months late for that, so. Oh, yeah, there's some seeds in there still. Anyway, and then over here you got the some Eryngium Leavenworthy ice still, still going off. Just barely hanging on. Looks like I might have to get seed of this. Okay, carrot family on this guy, APACA. All right, you could still see just a hint of how, you know, magnificent, how fucking great these look when they're flowering. You got the blue anthers sticking off, uh, stick, you know, poking out of each individual flower. Again, this whole, uh, what looks like a, a massive flower, what looks like a flower is actually a massive, uh, a massive uh, organization of a bunch of tiny little florets. And see, this guy's done already, so there's seed in there. You can collect seed of this, Jesus, without stabbing yourself. Just take that head off and then, uh, you know, just kind of flick it with your thumb. And maybe you might have to break it in half and there should be little flaky seeds that come out. I'm surprised this guy isn't grown more. All right, this whole thing must have been lit up pink and purple, you know, probably, uh, I don't know, what? Two or three weeks ago, maybe? Okay, there you go. See, there's the seed. I just, I found a, I found a brown and crispy one and just uh, broke it off, broke the top spike off. Okay, and then just broke it in half. And ran my thumb along, and you can see the little, those little uh, white scaly things. Those are the seeds, okay? Another way to do it is just take a bunch, put them in a bag, take them home, you know, do this over a sheet of paper or something, and then you just separate out the chaff and, you know, keep the seed. Then I put the seed in the, one of those little drug baggies I carry around with me that gets the cops so excited. Oryngium, of course, is a large genus. It occur, occurs all over the world. Okay, you get that, some down in South America, they... You know, get a basal rosetta leaves looking like an agave, about six to seven feet across, okay? Wonderful fucking genius. Almost hard to believe it's a carrot. Another guy, done flowering, all brown and crispy, but that means the seed is ready too. Grindelia lanceolata. Okay, differs from Grindelia ciliata in the leaves. You can see that. Okay, same texture. You can see the, uh, you can see all those, that, that white waxy resin just occurring like little, uh, little dots and glands on the, uh, on the leaf right there, it's still got that dentate margin, but much different shape to it. Okay, so there's the seed, you can see him right there, just looking like little uh, beige tamales uh, amongst the chaff. See, they've got those tree right up front, okay? So you just, uh, that's, and again, that's just from, you know, taking my thumb and going like that and collecting the what comes out in my hand, all right? If they were still green, I'd put them in a little paper bag, let them dry out a little bit, you know, leave some stem in there so they can mature a little bit longer. And, uh, and then just uh, shake them out over a piece of paper, separate them out, etc. And, you, of course, you can go spread them around your own damn yard, get some nice natives going, okay? That's attracting more, uh, you know, pollinators and what the shit, etc. Instead of, you know, planting out the, the hideous Home Depot garden center shit that's so prevalent in the region, the crepe myrtles and boxwoods and oleanders and whatever. Okay, so as you can see, we've stepped into the understory, the forest right here. You got the uh, Junipurus virginiana, okay, commonly uh, called cedar, even though it's not even in the same family as cedar. The true cedars, none of them uh, occur in North America. They're all, they're all from uh, Eurasia, okay. They're in a pine family. This is in the redwood family, Cupressaceae. It's Junipurus virginiana again. This right here, you got the uh, Texas cedar elm, Ulmus crassifolia, okay. You can see you got the and a little bit of a wing, at least when they're young. A little bit of a winged stem right there. And then stepping further into the understory, hopefully not picking up any uh, ticks or poison oak, we got an Ilex decidua, okay? In the holly and the yerba mate family, aquafoliaceae. And uh, you can see right there those little berries. I'm so conspicuous when this uh, 
plant drops its leaves, okay, which it's doing right about now, you know, partially because of drought and, prop, you know, partially probably because of the uh, reduced hours of sunlight here in mid-October. But when it drops its leaves, these berries stand out like hell. They're poisonous, too. You can't eat them. But I believe, uh, like Ilex vomitoria, uh, the leaves contain caffeine. You could probably make a uh, make a little uh, upper drink out of them. And then back here, one of my favorite plants, and a member of the maple in the, the uh, buckeye family. This is Ognatia speciosa. Oh, shit, that one just fell. Let's see if they got any seed in there. Okay, very, uh, very conspicuous uh, three-lobed uh, fruit right there. There's a, yeah, there's a seed. Okay, it looks like a little a mini buckeye. All right, and I believe uh, this is only this is only known from uh, northern Mexico and the state of Texas as well. And you can see it's already dropped its leaves. It's drought deciduous. Okay, like it's uh, like it's relative uh, Aesculus californica, which is also you know the California buckeye, which is also drought deciduous. They just drop their needles when it gets hot and dry. They kind of just shut down and say, "Fuck it, I'm done for this season." Okay, so look at this. This is pretty interesting, too. You can see here there's some miski, prosopis, all right, which is, you know, to me indicates that uh, we're in a little bit drier of an ecoregion, all right, because this is, this is a plant that's extremely drought tolerant. You find it in deserts a lot. Fabaceae, of course, is the subfamily. They, you know, they use it to, uh, to flavor the meats and whatnot over the barbecue and what the shit. Anyway, over here we got a member of that uh, same family that the Texas Buckeye is in, okay, kind of looks like shit now no flowers so it's you know <laughs> there's not much i can show you for diagnostic uh, factors except that uh pinnate leaf structure there this is a sapindus dramondii and it's in the sapindaceae it's the genus that the the family was named after the sapindaceae maples are in the same family and I, you know i don't even know why i'm showing you this because there's i can't show you know you can't go by leaves it's not going to be enough to teach you a goddamn plant and uh there's no fruits or flowers I can show you. So, but anyway, there you go. Important, important to mention. It's a member of the ecology and what the shit. You can see the nice opuntia everywhere too. Oh, nice. Okay, here we go. This is one of my my favorite uh, plants of the region, and this is a pretty uh, aggressive native. Okay, kind of a weedy native. You'll find it coming up in uh, disturbed sites like under power lines, you know, along the margins of railroad tracks and what the shit. This is Euphorbia bicolor. Look at that beautiful uh, variegation on those leaves right there. There's another Euphorbia species, Marginata, which gets that same kind of variegation, but the bracts are much wider. It, lo it looks different, too, and it doesn't have that uh, as thick a pubescence as a uh, bicolor does. But uh, anyway, so Euphorbia bicolor, you can see right now, it's a perennial plant. But you can grow it as an annual in uh, colder climates, and they get about, you know, three or four feet tall. And it's nice when you see, oh, hi, Jack. It's nice when you'll see just, you know, whole fields of them, all right, just kind of, you know, especially when you're going by them on a road rubbernecking and you, what the shit is that? And of course, being a euphorbia, that uh, they've got that very distinct uh, and notable uh, pseudanthium, aka composite flower structure called a cyathium, all right, cyathium is a, a, a specific to the genus euphorbia. Those fuzzy uh, nutsack looking things I'm showing you right here, those are the actual, those are actually the ovaries. Okay, a three carpeled ovary. Some of them still have the style on them. If I can show you that, the style and the stigma. It's the three branched stigma. There we go. Okay, so right there you got, you got front and center, you got a, a pollinated ovary. All right, maturing. Soon, soon it'll have seed in it. And then uh, back there you can see that little uh, yellow ant, what looks like a yellow anther. Okay, at the base of that, uh, that pollinated ovary. That's actually a male flower. And then just behind that, on a separate cyathium, uh, you got a unpollinated uh, ovary with still got the three uh, the three style branches on it. That stigma, see that? Okay, so basically what you got what you got is just a highly reduced, simplified, uh, compact flower. All right. So what looks what looks like one flower, no petals, no sepals, nothing. Those those white things that look like petals are actually bracteoles. And, uh, and then, of course, you got that massive ovary just looking like a big fuzzy nutsack in the middle there. Okay, it's called, again, it's called the cyathium, plural cyathia. And they're, uh, you, you know, they're, they're specific to the genus Euphorbia, which, of course, is a fucking massive genus that occurs all over the world. And you get some of the succulent ones that get, you know, upwards of 20 feet tall and look like cacti occurring in a, the southern part of the African continent. Another thing about this species that's notable, and, uh, you know, all Euphorbias will do this, is that it, you could see it bleeding 
uh, that latex right there. Okay, and interesting about this specific species is there was, I believe, a research paper published last year, I believe it was published last year, uh, touting the benefits to some of the phytochemicals in that latex for non-opioid pain relief. So they've got properties that, uh, you know, somehow block uh, nerve receptors and, uh, you know, can act as a, an analgesic that's uh, not going to stop your heart rate if you do too many of them like uh, so many of the, uh, the opiates are, will. There's more of that like goose drum. It's just everywhere, you know. It's a very, it's kind of naturalized itself. Okay, you can see those berries on there. Little, little olive looking fruits, okay, but it's because it's in the olive family, Oleaceae. Note how the, uh, note how the foliage is not quite opposite, all right. One, one uh, leaf node is just a little bit below the other, all right. Helpful in identifying it. Okay, there's another member of that family, another genus that's actually native here called the uh, Forest Thiera, but I haven't seen any. Around here, I've just seen this uh, this uh, invasive bastard that you can see. I mean, it, it ends up forming in some areas just walls. Okay, you guys are going to be fucking annoyed with me because I'm just showing you stuff that looks like shit you'd see in a vacant lot. And for the most part, that's a, it's a pretty correct assessment, okay? But maybe you'll look a little bit harder next time. This is a member of the uh, Ambrosia subtribe of the Helianthiae Alliance of the Sunflower family. This is Iva annua. Okay, and the reason I'm showing it to you is because it was an important food source for native people, all right? These uh, spikes you'll see are unlike uh, spikes in the Ambrosia genus, okay? Remember, the spikes in the Ambrosia genus have male flowers up top, female flowers on the bottom. These, uh, these flower heads, these capitula, are bisexual, all right? And this, you can see the seeds occur. You can see them right there. Maybe just barely. Little black uh, sunflower seed-looking things. They occur in the outer ring of... Uh, tiny flowers that are all clustered together in his flower head okay and those again were were used as a major food source for native peoples got a nice uh got a, got a lot of nice lipids and proteins and shit in there oh yeah see that okay and of course they're uh, each each flower head is subtended by this uh ciliate bract all right there's the leaves right there just the opposite and what's the margin on those look like oh yeah a little bit a little bit serrate Okay, got a scabbard texture to it, like so many of the uh, members of the Asteraceae. Okay, so maybe, you know, maybe next time you see this, uh, you'll have a little bit of appreciation for it. Okay, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Again, Anemophilus wind-pollinated, but uh, different from Ambrosia in that the uh, the flower heads are bisexual. Okay, remember, whereas Ambrosia has the female flowers and thus the seeds at the bottom of that spike. There you go, Iva annua, all right? Why don't you try eating some seed out of there? Tell me, let me know how it tastes, okay? Shake them out, make a nice little meal, throw them in your quinoa or whatever the shit. See, there's there's the seeds, okay? There you go. Uh, in the DYC department, which I happen to love, the composite, uh, you got a, a plant colloquially known as Texas broom, Amphiacris trichunculoides, okay? And it can look a lot like another plant uh, that uh, it grows St. Patrick with that can often be found growing next to it, Gutierrezia texana. I'll show you how to tell uh, how to differentiate the two later on. But you can see how ubiquitous this plant is. It's just forming a massive field of gold right here. And of course, you got the Euphorbia bicolor mixed in with it and with this shit. We're surrounded by a forest of a Junipurus virginiana and a Texas cedar elm, Ulmus crassifolia. Real beautiful landscape right here. You go part of the uh, part of the effort to learn to identify plants when they're just in their vegetative stage. They got no goddamn flowers. Okay, but you do have uh, a calyx and uh, maturing fruit. You go Ruellia nudiflora, Acan Acanthaceae. All right, flowers are purple when they're on there, but obviously they're they're done. What you're looking at is just the open calyx, and then of course the superior ovary right there, that uh, capsule fruit which will mature. Turn brown, dry out, dehiss, and dump out a bunch of tiny seeds. Okay. Foliage on this being in the uh, Lamialis, the order of uh, mints and sages. Uh, the foliage is opposite, of course. So there's that. Okay, and here we go. Another ubiquitous but beautiful bastard, Helianthus maximilini. Okay, a perennial sunflower, so it comes back every year. You can see this guy is just flush. All right. All right, early fall, he's still going off. Notable about this, he got leaves that almost the... Uh, you basically lack a petiole, okay? They're just attached right to the stem, no leaf stalk. Con duplicate, they're folded, all right? Almost the, almost you could call it keeled too, I guess. Typical of Helianthus phyleries, okay? 
at least on a lot of the ones down here, these kind of like spiky filamentous multi cereal filaries. And again, if you want that seed, just cut that flower head off. At least if, it, if it's brown already, you could just take seed from it already. But see, this is still green, still attached to the vasculature of the plant. Just snip it off right there, throw it in a paper bag, let it mature. In about a week, all the seeds will fall out. And if they don't, you just run your thumb over it. And you got about, I don't know, 80 seeds right there. In case you could reseed your garden, whatever the shit. Massive. These guys get upwards of 10 feet tall. They form these big clumps, okay? Don't plant it anywhere. It, uh, you don't want it to take over, okay? But I love shit. I would love this to take over my yard. <clears throat> God damn. Love this plant. Of course, it's a full. it needs full sun. Just needs full sun. And look at that. You just got how many goddamn flowers on a single stock? I don't know, upwards of 15 or 20. There's the... Uh, it's stem. See how scabbard it is? Get those kind of stiff little hairs. All right. Oh, yeah, it feels like sandpaper. Got your nice uh, multi branched liatris going off, too. Looks like a uh, liatris punctata. Oh, shit. <laughs> Just let's bum that guy out. Sorry, guy. You know, spiky filaries on this guy. Kind of blend. The leaves almost are as spiky as the filaries. Look at that. Okay. And again, just, just lit up here. All right, in the 92 degree autumn that we're <laughs> that we're in right now. Oh, Rus copalinum, the winged sumac too. Look at that. Okay, another ubiquitous prairie plant right here. We got Radabita column there for you. You can see the whole capitulum is kind of cone shaped. That's why they're called the cone flowers. Only got a few ligules on there, and they're red and yellow. Okay, and then flip it over. You can see even the involucre is pretty reduced. Not very many filaries on there. Got that scabbard texture on the stem. And then again with these, to get the seed off these, you can see there's the old capitulum, just consisting of a bunch of seeds that readily dehiss once you run your thumb out of Those are all tiny seeds. Put them in a bag. Okay, reseed your gardener with this shit. There's the foliage. Relatively uh, filamentous, okay? Just kind of lacy, ooh. Okay, uh, greetings. Now we're a little bit west of Fort Worth. I tend to like uh, Fort Worth a little bit better than uh, than Dallas, you know? Just uh, pretty, generally prettier buildings. Okay, it's uh, older buildings, older architecture, more of a railroad town. I actually got dragged by a freight train once here about 20 years ago trying to board it. Well, well, as a young man. I spent a lot of years as a young man rambling around Texas on trains. But uh, we're going we're gonna to address our attention over here to this composite clusterfuck. Now, this, is, this all looks like one species, right, of, uh, of yellow composite. They're colloquially known as the DYCs, but it's actually two different species that end up looking a lot alike. One is Gutierrezia texana, and the other is Amphiacris trichunculoides. Okay, this, this first one is the Amphiacris trichunculoides. Notice how all the flowers are up towards the top, okay, the top of the branches right there, kind of forming a little corim, okay? So we'll take this, uh, we'll take this off over here, and then we'll, hello Jack. Notice we're on the, uh, that uh, mid-Cretaceous chalk, roughly 120 million years old, and we'll hold it next to this plant, which is a completely different species, okay? On the right, you got uh, Gutierrezia texana, and on the left, you got the uh, Amphiacris trichunculoides, right? But they look, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they look like the goddamn same plant. Okay, so what the fuck are the differences? Well, we'll start with Amphiacris first, okay? Amphiacris trichunculoides, notice that there's no flowers along uh, along the lower parts of the stem. Again, all the, all the flowers are up towards the top, okay? Much like a corim, all right? And then over here, we'll look at Gutierrezia. Look, you got the... You got flowers just branching off. Where's a good example? Yeah, right here. So you got flowers branching off midway, midway up the stem. Okay, but that's you know that's kind of yeah, it's kind of mishmashy, not so easy to see. Let's look at the individual flowers. Okay, so let's take a flower of this uh, Amphiacris. Okay, there's an individual flower at the uh, Amphiacris, an individual flower head. Notice the style branches are relatively short in the disc florets. Okay, pay attention to those filaries too. They're relatively blunt tipped compared to the. Uh, Phyleries on Gutierrezia. All right, now let's take a flower of uh, a capitulum of Gutierrezia. Look at the style branches poking out the disc flowers right there, looking like little bug antennas. Then flip that bastard over, or better yet, take a flower that's uh, not open yet, and look at those uh, phyleries. They're nowhere near as blunt tipped. Okay, almost looks like they got a little white, uh, very thin striation along the uh, the center of the phylary, and they're a lot thinner and narrower. Okay, go rip rip the flowers off. I you know holding them up. Uh, Side by side for you, the individual flower heads. On the left, Gutierrezia texana. On the right, the uh, Amphiacris trichunculoides. All right, look at the filaries too. See, they're a little bit wider and a little bit more blunt tipped uh, in the one on the right, the Amphiacris trichunculoides. But again, those styles are much longer in Gutierrezia texana. There you go. Okay, and then again, 
Look at that. See, you got the all kinds of look. They're, they're buds along the stem. Right? You wouldn't see that in amphiacris, all right? This is why people don't study composites, all right? At least a lot of them, okay? It takes a real masochist, all right? I count myself among them to be obsessed with composites, all right? But again, the whole family's, you know, 28,000 species deep all over the, all over the globe except the Antarctica, you know, probably the, arguably the most uh, ecologically successful plant family, all right? So there you go. There's Gutierrezia texana and uh, Amphiacris trucunculotes. What a fucking pain in the ass. If, if this is not your thing, don't don't worry. I don't I don't blame you for it. All right. This is why, this is why they got the name DYCs, damn yellow composites. Are you ready to go? One of Texas's uh, many artificial lakes, just held up by a reservoir. And in the uh, background, you got the gentle ambiance of uh, jets from the Lockheed Martin plant over there. It is species of Ceanothus ramnaceae, okay? Ceanothus herbaceus. There's only, I believe, uh, three or four species in Texas. This is the most common one. Only gets about three feet tall. Okay, incredibly drought tolerant. Loves the limestone. No topsoil here. Okay, there's the old, uh, there's the fruits have already dehissed off this plant. There's one flowering down the way I'll show you in a minute. Over here you got a species of Budalua, the eyebrow, the eyebrow grass. Just looking like those little paste on eyebrows you see on the ladies on Telemundo, okay? So you can see those uh, stamens just uh, drooping out of that flower right there. There's the basil rosette. Oh, nice. Oh, there we go. There we go. Very ecologically important plant right here, okay? Remember the coyote bush genus, Bacchus? This is Bacchus neglecta, all right? And this, this individual, look, there's a little crab spider waiting right there, okay? This, uh, this uh, individual species... Uh, it's mostly a plant of Texas, a little bit of northern Mexico, a little bit of New Mexico. But you can see it just forms these massive clumps, okay? Sometimes you'll see it on the side of the road, just thickets of this stuff, all right? It's a dioecious plant like cannabis, all right? And this is a male. Okay, you can see all those little uh, staminate uh, flower heads right there. Discoid flowers, no ligules, all right? So that's a male. What does a female look like? This is what the female looks like. You can see all those... Uh, the, that fuzz poking out, that's the pappus. Remember, Asteraceae flowers have a pappus. It's basically just a, it's, a, it's assumed to be a modified calyx, but it often helps in dispersal, okay? Like the dandelion uh, fuzz that you that you see on and dandelion seeds is a pappus, okay? So, of course, uh, you know, if uh, the, the male plants, since they don't produce any seed, they don't have a pappus, but the female plants uh, produce uh, all those tiny seeds, which, of course, get wind dispersed when these things mature and open up. You can see the fuzz right there. This plant is just covered in pollinators, all right? This is a very important uh, species ecologically because you'll just see, like you got a wasp up there. Okay, I, I saw some of these uh, a week or two ago in Austin, and they were just covered. They had American snout butterflies all over them, wasps, honeybees, you know, native bees, all kinds of, all kinds of pollinators just covering these fucking things. Okay, very important plant. And, you know, it's often just assumed to be a weed, but, uh, you know, Again, it's just, uh, it's incredibly important. It smells, it smells pretty strong too, okay? So all those white composite uh, flowers, okay? Gucknadia, same thing. Kind of smell, they kind of smell musky, like sweet musky, all right? I don't know. Some people think they smell like feet. I think they kind of, they kind of smell good, okay? Kind of like sweet feet. But, uh, and again, they're just everywhere. One of the first plants to, you know, colonize disturbed areas uh, down here too. Okay, here we go. This is a, this is a member of the Fabaceae, the legume family, and it's a plant uh, generally of riparian areas. This is Sesbania herbacea, okay? It's mostly a plant of the southeast. You get it in Mexico a little bit too. There's those yellow pea flowers. Fabordia is the subfamily here. Only gets about uh, four or five feet tall. Look at that big uh, banner back there. Remember, you got the banner, uh, the wings on either side, and then that keel, of course, and inside that keel is where you got the uh, ten stamens. There you go, I peeled that uh, keel back, you could see the ten stamens, nine fused together, and then the odd one out. Alright, that tenth one, of course, standing alone by itself. It's called being diadelphus, and uh, many, many members of the Faboidea subfamily, the pea family, do that. Alright, so keep in mind how small this flower is, and then we're going to go over here and look at these enormous-ass legume fruits that come out of it. Look at that. It's about, I don't know, what, 15 times the, the length of that flower over there? I mean, legumes, <laughs> they just, they never cease to amaze me. All right, there's some species in South Africa that get legume fruits. Uh, I think it's equatorial Africa that get legume fruits about, you know, two or three feet long. All right, and again, the flower, I mean, the flower is large, but it's only about that big. The entire legume fruit that comes out of it is almost three feet goddamn long. I don't know how they do it. Incredible plants, of course, they're nitrogen fixers. They got the rhizobium bacteria in there. 
pinnate leaves, all right, you can see them just forming a massive colony. And a wonderful native plant, and again, a plant of riparian areas. This is, this is how they get you. You see this, you think it's an ash, and then you think this is just a branch of it. But no, it turns out it's actually a poison oak, the ash rash plant, and you'll end up with contact dermatitis. So I'm just going to sneak under this fucker right there. Oh yeah, beautiful exposure of that Cretaceous limestone up there. Oh, that's nice. You gotta love limestone. So now we're approaching more of the habitat that I tend to love the most, the dry and rocky stuff. Okay, but you can see we still got some prairie, uh, some prairie members going on. Got that nice, uh, look at a nice yucca. Looks like a yucca pallida. And then you got, uh, again, that little blue stem grass, that the uh, Skyzacrium, Scoparia. Over here we got a, and oddly it's still flowering, we got a uh, Ceanothus herbaceus. See, there's the little uh, kind of spherical inflorescences. Okay, pedestal's not too long, maybe about three, four millimeters. And then, uh, see if we can get a good flower. These flowers look like they're on their way out, too. <laughs> they're not feeling the heat, either. Maybe a little bit. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's the, uh, the fruits are long gone. The fruits violently dehiss, kind of explosive dehiscence, shoot away from the plant like that uh, as the, uh, the tissue dries. You can see this whole, whole branch is dead. So as the tissue dries, it puts pressure on that seed, and then if, on the fruit, rather, and then it just shoots its seed out, uh, sends it away. They're nice ramnaceous uh, flowers right there. Nice uh, Ceanothus venation. You can see the three main veins in that leaf. And again, all members of the Ceanothus, of course, are nitrogen fixing, okay, due to their association with the actinomycete bacteria in the genus Frankia. Another nice legume, looking like shit <laughs> in late summer, early fall. So dry, so hot. You can see it's got the internodal uh, thorns right there, okay? I know that's a very important diagnostic factor when you're looking at the, any of these uh, plants in the uh, mimosa clad. This is mimosa borealis, okay? Are the spines between the nodes or do they occur at the nodes, aka are they just stipular spines? Whatever, okay? First time I saw this, I thought it was a Senegalia, which again used to be in the genus Acacia, but uh, there's no native Acacias in North America anymore. They got split up into a Vichelia or Senegalia. So there you go. And it's kind of, you know, kind of bushy. I'd love to see it in flower. I'd love to see it in fruit. Unfortunately, we don't got it. We don't got either. So I can't show you, but just uh, kind of a little shrubby legume. And there's that foliage. Look at that. Bipinate. Ooh. Look at this. Everybody looks like shit. Everybody's, everybody's closing up shop for the season, right? They're tired of the heat. It's not just the shorter daylight hours. It's also the fact that it's 90 degrees in mid-October, okay? Actually, it cooled off to about 86 now, just before sundown. Anyway, here's another member of the Ramnaceae, same family as that Ceanothus I just showed you. This is Frangula caroliniana, and you can see there's the fruit right there. Common name for that is a coffee berry, okay? But don't go eating that fruit because it's not, I don't believe it's edible. I think it'll just make you puke. It won't, it won't poison you. You're not going to die, but you'll end up puking. Another thing about that Frangula is note the, note the very uh, distinct uh, venation on that, okay? A lot of members of... Uh, Frangula have that, Karwinskia has that, they just moved the genus Karwinskia, but it's another uh, another member of the buckthorn family, Ramnaceae. Oh, I, I love the rocky shit. My favorite kind of habitat, the dry and rocky shit. Here's a real interesting bastard, okay, and this is a relatively small one. Euphorbiaceae is the family, poinsettia family, and uh, this is Stilingia texana. See that uh, red pigmentation of the leaves right there? Kind of gives it away a little bit, there's a uh, Euphorbia you can see that red margin. Look at the the red margin along with the uh, the serrate margin, little sawtooth leaves. And uh, some of these can get massive fucking lignol tumors. Tubers. You can see a bunch of shoots just poking out from the uh, perennial massive root down there. I'll see if I can find a better one for you over there. Anyway, there you go. Stilingia texana. Oh yeah, there you go. There's a nice lignol tuber. That's Stilingia. And there's a uh, there's one with a fruit still on it. That three carpeled fruit that gives it away is a euphorbia, or at least uh, I see that three carpeled fruit that put it up, uh, you know, to be, put it towards the top of my list as a uh, plant families to, you know, if I didn't know what this was. Can okay, you see that the three segmented fruit? Okay, this one's still got a style on it. And again, that red color. God damn, I love this plant. You could see that massive. How deep? How deep down you think that goes? That big ass uh, caudiciform root, that that uh, massive lignotuber. 
And then just beyond that big uh, stilingia with the giant ass root, we got a member to ask the race here. We're just doing a vegetative ID right now. No flowers or fruits because it's out of season, right? This guy, this fucker flowered about, I don't know, four or five months ago. This is Hymenopapus scabiosaeus. Okay, but even with that foliage, he's a stunning bastard. Look, covered in a covered in a little little fuzz down there. Got a nice little blue color to him. Okay, and he's got the, uh, oh, look at that. A nice, uh, nice stem. You know, as he as he grows, Okay, the, the older foliage just falls off and he gets this nice little uh, mini trunk to him. How about that? Look at that. That's my ideal type of habitat right there. Look at that. Nice ammonite in there too. Okay, just before they went extinct, maybe 40 million years before they went extinct, this is like mid-Cretaceous, so that's about 100 million years ago. And the ammonites, uh, they dipped out in uh, that whole uh, KT boundary thing, you know, that took out the dinosaurs. You know, that big uh, big meteorite slamming into the Yucatan. We go growing uh, fully exposed on the uh, hot and dry limestone. Another member of the uh, Caryophyllaceae over here. This is a uh, Peronychia, Peronychia virginica. Look at that uh, nice uh, big uh, corum of uh, tiny flowers there. Five petaled flowers with the uh, stamens uh, poking out ever so perfectly. Stamens and little banana sh banana shaped anthers. Right there, you got the uh, entire plant. Okay, red stems, almost segmented stems, and then at the base, right there, you could see the leaves. Just little needle-like leaves. All right, like uh, so many members of this goddamn family. Caryophyllaceae, of course, being a namesake family of the genus Caryophyllales. Same order as spinach, beets, and cacti. And what this shit? Oh, look, you got a little hymenopapus coming up right there. God, I love the limestone. Holy fuck. Okay, so continuing on with our uh, vegetative parts only uh, botany lesson right here. Here's another uh, fantastic bastard and another uh, plant whose uh, main uh, population distribution is in Texas. This is Vernonia lindheimeri. Okay, note those uh, woolly multi cereate phyleries. Like you can see there's no flowers. These guys flowered about, I don't know, three months ago. Uh, beautiful purple flowers, beautiful purple and magenta flowers. Okay, and uh, they're just re the seeds ready to go. You can see the pap is sticking out for that nice wind dispersal. But more interesting here is this is like a this is basically a drought adapted vernonia. Okay, look at that how thin that foliage is. Okay, thin it's glabrous up top, glabrous up top, smooth up top, kind of waxy, and then on the abaxial surface you got the uh, it's all fuzzy. All right, of course that being an adaptation to the hot and dry, which uh, we got going on right here. Just you know practically no topsoil. Just the just the damn Cretaceous limestone. You can see the yucca palette going off right there. All right, really fucking cool plant. When I first seen this, I was kind of blown away because Vernonia, you know, is a genus you see in the Midwest, you know, mostly east of the Rockies. And, uh, you know, they got generally larger leaves. Some of them get four or five feet tall. All right, very showy flowers, okay? It's just sticking out like a big red flag, the pollinators. But to see one that's adapted to drought, okay, intense drought, I mean... You know, summertime temperatures of 105 degrees, no topsoil, no rain, okay? I mean, it's, you know, we're kind of east of the, east of the Sonoran Desert here. I mean, I guess technically the Chihuahuan Desert, which gets more rain. Well, this isn't really the Chihuahuan Desert. Forget forget about that. We're like northern, north of the Chihuahuan Desert. But the point is, it's fucking hot and dry. And though you do get some rain, okay, especially when you got no topsoil, it's, you know, plants are going to have a lot, a lot of uh, stress on them, okay? And apparently, Vernonia lindheimeri is a, adapted uh, perfectly to it look at that tops out about you know three two three feet tall needle-like foliage and uh of course he's got that perennial taproot down there that uh you know it can die back to when uh conditions are not uh, conducive to growth okay speaking of lignotubers you can see one of uh liatris punctata not flowering of course a little late for that putting puts putting seed up but you can see that massive root down there at the bottom of the plant Okay, just storing all that energy and, you know, giving it, giving the plant something to die back to, you know, during times of drought or times of, uh, of uh, freezing and frost. Well, that's all I got for you tonight. I had to cut the video a little short. There's, there's another plant I wanted to show you. You got some Sylphia melbiflorum growing over there, but you got some teens smoking weed. I don't want to inter interfere with their safety meeting. So, uh, anyway, wonderful sunset tonight. I don't know why people feel like they got to play their music on their fucking boats over there. Anyway, that's all I got for you tonight. Uh, have a nice, uh, have a nice rest of the evening. Don't be a prick. Go fuck yourself. Bye.